Hello, I'm Femi OK. Today on The Stream, we are going to look at how three countries successfully tackled the coronavirus. Hello, Carton. Welcome to The Stream. Tell everybody who you are. Uh, my name is Kjartan Nielsen. I'm the assistant to the director of health in Iceland. I'm a former journalist and I've been uh, helping uh, my director and the chief epidemiologist focus their message to the people. Uh, so it's been a it's been a quite a ride here in, in Iceland and I can't wait to talk to you all about it. Yeah, we're, look, we're looking forward to hearing about it. Valin, welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself. Tell our global audience who you are. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is uh, Berlin Tran. I'm a postdoctoral researcher based in Saigon. I'm looking at um, Vietnamese innovation and business response during COVID-19. Great to have you on the stream. And welcome, Michael, to the stream. Tell everybody who you are. Thanks, Femi. My name is Michael Baker. I'm a professor of public health at a medical school in Wellington. That's the University of Otago. And I've also been on the technical advisory group for our Ministry of Health helping them with their response to the to COVID-19. Welcome, Michael. More from him in just a little bit. So how have some countries beaten COVID-19? If you have questions for our expert panel, you know what to do if you're on YouTube. Jump into the chat and you can be part of the conversation. And that conversation starts in New Zealand. Going into alert level four, one of the most stringent variations of lockdown seen across the world for a full four weeks was difficult initially for people to adapt to and certainly very hard on businesses and the wider economy. But the structure that this offered tied to direct actions that people were expected to take led to a clarity that was very helpful, very containing and led to an increased sense of safety as it became clear as we approached two weeks into that lockdown that it was having a big effect upon case numbers. Michael, what is the COVID status of New Zealand today? We've eliminated this virus. We haven't had a case of local transmission for over six weeks. So that's um, uh, obviously a good state to be in. We um, are having uh, still um, imported cases uh, who are detected on arrival. Um, we have two weeks quarantine. So we're still getting a steady stream of New Zealanders coming back to the country and they're developing the illness, being diagnosed. But they actually don't threaten our elimination status because they're not released from quarantine until they've cleared the virus. Was the original plan total elimination of COVID-19? No, um, like most countries in the world, we were following the standard pandemic influenza plan, which, if you like, is a kind of mitigation approach. So that's because you can't really, really stop influenza at the borders um, and you, you, you're trying to flatten the curve, basically, and reduce the, the harm it causes. But um, by uh, mid-March, when we were starting to see local transmission in New Zealand, we really, we really looked at the success of Asian countries at, at containing this infection. And so we changed our direction very swiftly to a containment or what you could call ultimately an elimination approach. And the goal of that is actually to stop transmission altogether. Uh -huh. uh, Michael, one man Lendes uh, has some very colourful language on YouTube. He, he says that... Uh, talking about the countries we're talking about today, so including New Zealand, uh, you have real leaders in these countries, unlike the um, M-words in Brazil and the United States. Um, he doesn't have very polite things to say, but he talks about leadership. You're talking to me about science, but one yes. is, I, I, I'm seeing leadership here. Yeah, well, I think the countries that have succeeded have had this combination of good science and good leadership and have acted very decisively. And I look at the other countries that are also really, in many cases across Asia, but also Iceland and a number of other countries that, that have acted very decisively, very proactively to deal with this virus. And they are the ones that have, have succeeded. And of course, we have a very empathetic leader, Jacinda Ardern, who I think has really taken the whole country with her. And so there's been this sense of collective action in New Zealand. And that really got us through this um, lockdown period. We've come out of it very cautiously to a virus-free country. That was the goal, and we've achieved that. What was lockdown like for you, Michael? Because lockdowns have been happening all around the world, but New Zealand 
took their lockdown incredibly seriously. What could you do? What could you not do? Basically, it was a bit like a stay at home order. You stayed at home unless you had to go out for essential supplies or medical care, or you were an essential worker. And that's like putting the whole country into home quarantine. And it's very effective. It basically stops the transmission of all these viruses. Influenza vanished as well. So it is, it is a very good approach if you want to get rid of a, a virus like this. Okay, uh, on, on Twitter, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger so everyone can see it. This is Ramin Shadid, and Ramin says, don't get too comfortable yet. The worst may be yet to come. That's quite ominous. Uh, is there any sense mm. of you saying, well, we're COVID free right now, but is there a but there? There is a but, and we are prepared for setbacks. And most countries that have achieved elimination or close to it have had problems, outbreaks, and I think they're manageable. I mean, we're gearing up for contact tracing, doing a huge amount of testing, even though we don't, we're not finding the virus in New Zealand. And when we look across, really across to you know China, Singapore, South Korea, Australia, they've all had setbacks. But the the overall effectiveness of pursuing elimination is you get your mortality rate really low, and most of your business can get back and operating again. So I think it's a great um, strategy, but you have to bargain on failures. I mean, people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to Sam Joho. He was the clinical psychologist who we had at the very top of this segment talking about New Zealand. You wouldn't think there would be a problem with being COVID free, but Saab identifies one for New Zealand. Let's have a listen. While much of the rest of the world is anxious about catching the virus itself or protecting their loved ones from catching it, it's not so much the presence of COVID-19 that presents New Zealand with its greatest challenge, but the absence of it. How do we find our place in this new world when actually we are one of the outliers who have been successful at eliminating COVID-19? Perhaps the anxiety that goes along with the uncertainty of what the world is going to look like and our place in it, and the economic pressures that may follow, these present the biggest challenge to New Zealand as we go through the next few months and perhaps years when we are so far away, not only geographically, but also in terms of the experience that much of the rest of the world is going through right now. Michael, what a problem to have. You could be lonely out there in New Zealand in your COVID free bubble. What are you gonna do? Well, we're hoping to connect quite soon with the other countries that have also eliminated this virus. And pretty soon it'll be much of the Eastern hemisphere, like mainland China, and Taiwan really have succeeded incredibly well. Vietnam, potentially, obviously Australia. There's quite a few Pacific islands that basically lifted the drawbridge. They've never had the virus and we will start connecting with them shortly. So I, I don't think we have a strong sense of loneliness or we won't have it for long. Mm -hmm. Michael Baker, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time here on the stream talking about New Zealand and its COVID-19 successful strategy. We go now to Vietnam, population 95 million, number of deaths from COVID-19, registered deaths, zero. I think Vietnam is a great example of a notion that you don't need to be a rich country to beat a pandemic as long as you are quick, well prepared and focused. A week after the first case was confirmed in late January, the country declared a public health emergency over the coronavirus epidemic. Around the same time, it was already in conversation with experts and manufacturers to develop its own testing kits. I think it's of interest to, to note that uh, the country didn't magically excel in uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. It comes from its experiences dealing with SARS in 2003 and avian influenza after that, which allows it to invest in public health infrastructure and early action. Balin, it's so good to have you here. Uh, it, it seems as if the experience that Vietnam had with infectious diseases put it in a good place for tackling COVID-19. What's your take? Um, uh, thank okay thanks for the, the question Femi and thank you again for, for having me. So the uh, Vietnam's rather successful response to COVID you know which has been recognized by the American CDC has been uh, a combination of both top-down policy action 
and perhaps more importantly, the bottom-up efforts by ordinary people. And so let, let's um, dissect that in turn. So top-down policy action was very swift, aggressive, and communicative. Uh, we shut all schools back in January before everyone else. We started to quarantine inbound travelers in February, restrict inbound traffic altogether in March, um, total country lockdown from late March to April, the military was involved. The population received constant communication from the government about the virus and precautionary measures to take. And I would like to emphasize that we have been very strict in isolating confirmed cases. If you were tested positive, you got sent to, well, sensibly, um, and anyone you came into contact with would also get tested. And the vicinity around where you lived got fenced off. Nobody oh. came in, so nobody we came out, but everyone inside thing. would be provided with food. All right, so Balin, we're talking really strict, not like if you feel like it, if you want to quarantine, were you taken away and then locked up until you were better? Um, not violently taken away. But so still we, taken away. We got yes, still taken away. Yeah, but after, away. after and we don't have we don't have a, it's, it's not a negotiation, Barlene. I mean, you you've got COVID nineteen. You need to be somewhere where you're not infecting other people. That that was the situation. Yes, that, that that's I, the idea behind I, it. Lots of questions on YouTube but, for you. Here's, here's Benjamin. Benjamin says, "I want to know the status of COVID nineteen in Vietnam. What is the status of COVID nineteen in Vietnam? Where where are you right now?" Um, so far, so far, we have 353 or 355 cases up to this day and zero death. And look, I mean, one thing, one thing that I that I, I want to, you know, even more emphasize than 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 the fact that we have been very strict is the the, the bottom up efforts by the ordinary citizen. Uh -huh. You know, we we stayed inside. Bailin, this we is a great were... point for me to bring in bring in Seven because Seven wanted to ask about that. Seven Varghese says, and he's on YouTube. Hi, Seven. How did the people in these countries, how did people in Vietnam, especially Vietnam, respond to lockdown measures? And how did the government ensure social justice problems, saying that food and shelter to those people who had no access? So really asking about what you're about to say. It was like, okay. how did people react to these, these very strict lockdowns? Um, good question. So the long story short is that uh -huh. we, we voluntarily contributed to the fight. We stayed inside, we wore masks when going out, businesses provided hand sanitizer for customers, to this day I might add, and some businesses even checked customers' temperature before letting them in. And to talk about you know, the issue of um, whether we we showed any resistance, whether what, what we thought about human rights. So we, the Vietnamese people, framed the virus as a life and death, or rather life or death matter. We did not have this strange ideological debate and protest against wearing masks, against staying at home and not going mm -hmm. to the barbershop, you know, like in some places in the US. Yeah. So and I, we, I did have to be, we, we have to be straightforward, though, with people, because this is perhaps the political situation in Vietnam actually helped in terms of locking down COVID-19 or eliminating it because it is a communist party system. So if you do not do what the party says, you will be in trouble. For instance, if you didn't uh, adhere to some of the regulations, you could be put in prison. But what you're saying is that this political system really helped fight COVID-19. It's, it's well, so what the point that I'm trying to make is that, yes, we, we had swift policy response. And well, obviously that came from our political system. You know, we have a, a one party system, but that, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that the people themselves thought of this as an important mm -hmm. issue. You know, we, we frame, we, we, we have never framed it as a personal liberty thing. I mean, look, we are, we are very poor. And we, we've been invaded time and time again for thousands of years. So then you got this um, sense of collective good, uh -huh. like in, in your collective unconsciousness. So you, you try to, I mean, at least at the family level, so you try to protect the people you love first. So let, let me Can tell I you a story. Can I share some 
okay, we've, we've got one minute left for the story. So tell the story very quickly. Okay. And I also want to share some pictures, some beautiful pictures you shared with me. So here's, tell me what's happening in this picture. Um, so that was one of the um, grassroots innovators. And that, that's making my point. So he, he is a famous mm -hmm. baker in Saigon. And he came up with the idea of, you know, making bread from fruit in order to help farmers who could not export yes. their produce during the pandemic. And no, nobody told him to. One more, one more um, story. And this picture, okay, so um, this picture is uh, showing that, you know, Vietnamese students coming back from abroad, going into quarantine. And you can see that the military, you know, people in, in blue um, uh, clothing, uh, the military was mobilized to help with the fight. Mm -hmm. This is a, it's a remarkable story that's coming from Vietnam. I really appreciate you sharing your insight and how you were involved in putting that strategy together. I think every country, however well they've done with COVID-19, has some anxiety. Earlier, we spoke to Zhang Li. Zhang Li is interested in business and he's a little bit anxious. Let's have a listen to Zhang Li from Vietnam. So far, nearly 80 days have lasted without any new case found in community. Many Vietnamese people decide to leave their mask at home, but upcoming international visitor seems to make them think twice. Valin Tran is a researcher. He's been very involved in advising the Vietnamese government with their COVID-19 strategy. Nobody has died according to official records from COVID-19 in Vietnam. It definitely qualifies as a success story. Valin, thank you so much for being on the stream today. We appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. So we move on to Iceland. The population is just over 300,000 and they've had officially recognized deaths 10 from COVID-19. What Iceland has done well in response to the COVID-19 pandemic is to respond quickly and to get everybody tested and to institute social distancing guidelines. This had an immediate impact on reducing the rate of infection and flattening the curve. However, it's been very challenging to get everybody to abide these guidelines as it's summertime and people want to go out and meet one another. Um, with the summer to come, July 1st saw us opening the country to certain select non-Schengen countries and the weeks and months to come will show whether or not we need to adjust our plan of action or not. So Carton, that is how you got there um, and that is where you are now. But the question is, how did you get there? When did your COVID-19 strategy start for Iceland? It started uh, uh, soon after we saw uh, reports coming out from Wuhan province uh, or Hubei province, sorry. Uh, we were definitely reminded of our experience with regards to Sir, uh, SIRS and Mars, uh, MERS. Uh, so we initiated our influenza pandemic uh, guidelines and, and brought the country to alert uh, rather quickly. We started testing early. Uh, and we're fortunate enough then to catch these first few cases that cropped up in, in Iceland. And that helped a lot. You even know in Iceland the first person who came into the country with COVID-19. That's how good your testing is. It, yes. Still, uh, we are finding out now that uh, there were other routes of transmission. We had cases when we were looking at northern Italy and the Alps region. Uh, we know now that uh, during that time, cases came to the country from the UK, probably the, the US. Uh, we know that now uh, because we have uh, sequenced the genome of the virus that these people had. So we know that the virus was coming to the country from multiple uh, directions. But still, uh, these were the first few cases. So we, uh, we caught a large portion of them and that definitely helped us in the long run. I want to show uh, our audience a gentleman here who uh, came out of retirement to help with COVID-19 in Iceland. He's a very well-known figure. You shared the photograph yes. with me. Tell everybody who, who is in this picture. Yes, so this is uh, Sigurdur Guðmundsson. He is the former uh, director of health in Iceland. He is a infectious disease doctor, a retired one. He is now a professor at the University Hospital. 
Uh, and this uh, great gentleman, uh, he uh, came out to help when we had our uh, search in cases. Uh, this was during a time where the situation was quite dire. We were looking at an exponential curve in cases. So it was an all hands on deck situation. We uh, put out a, a request for retired uh, healthcare professionals to come out and help us help at the university hospital. Sigurdur was one of them. And, and, and I, I find this photo quite, quite, um, uh, quite uh, fantastic because you, you can see yeah. it in his face that, that this is a, a serious situation and it most certainly was. Yeah, I, I mean, if we could sum up how Iceland beat the coronavirus, which was our initial question, how did some people beat the coronavirus? How did some countries beat the coronavirus? Probably testing and also testing with public and private funds as well. Yes, definitely. Tell us about uh, private but funds. Of course, uh, we uh, were approached by a uh, a genetic science company in Iceland called Decode. They they saw uh, the problem that we were dealing with. The main problem was that we didn't really know how widely the virus has spread in the community when we started uh, uh, finding the positive cases. We didn't know where we were in the epidemiological curve, and we needed to know that. Uh, so we could focus our measures. Uh, so DECODE came in and they vol volunteered to screen uh, asymptomatic individ individuals, uh, individuals who had not been exposed to the uh, virus. Uh, mm -hmm. So they initiated that uh, screening program. Uh, it was coordinated by the chief epidemiologist and the director of health. And they screened a large portion of the uh, population mm -hmm. in Iceland. And we found out that the virus was uh, certainly present in the community, but it was not spreading rapidly between people. Oh. So we knew at that time where we were exactly in the outbreak. And, and, and based on that information, we could improve our modeling and we could also focus our measures more, more, uh, more accurately. Uh, Kat, in every country that we've heard about so far, New Zealand, Vietnam, now Iceland, has very unusual circumstances which made them prime for being able to beat coronavirus. If you could sum up what it was that Iceland has that put it in a good position to beat the coronavirus, what would you say? Well, you just have to look at the uh, geography. We are a small uh, island nation. Our population is uh, uh, homogenous. Uh, there are short communication pathways. We have highly educated healthcare professionals. We have uh, fantastic people who are in charge. So all these aspects come together. And, and not the least, we have really only one major point of entry to the country. So it was uh, easier for us than, than probably any other country to, to find the early cases of COVID-19. And that helped. And also the community here in Iceland, as I said, we are an island nation and we've been through uh, terrible events in the past. Mm -hmm. And whenever a, a, a problem of, of, of this magnitude where the country is threatened in some way, we usually come together and we are willing to make some sacrifices, uh, even mm -hmm. though things are going to be rough for a while. So Nicole comments on YouTube that it's geography and population density would put you in a very good position to fight COVID-19, but also mm. early access, uh, early action is something that I can see all three countries and all the other countries that we looked at that were doing really well with COVID-19. Yeah. Early, 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 early action and then leadership. I, I have to show this picture. You shared this with us. Um, sometimes they're known as the trio. Um, yes. Sometimes they're known as the, the Trinity. Uh, these three people, who are they? They represent three different important areas of expertise and, and they would run the press conferences. I, I have very little time left, Carlton, so just very quickly explain yeah, who course. they are. So this from the left, that's Vidir Reynason. He is the uh, police chief superintendent. He organized the civil uh, service response. In the middle, there's Thorler Guðnason. He is the chief epidemiologist. And then mm -hmm. we have Alma Muller, the director of health. So the, these people at that, this photo was taken during a time when we were not really sure what was happening with the outbreak in, in, in so Iceland. they're looking very and, serious and there. Yes, they are. Uh, uncharacteristic, uh, they are not really that serious <laughs> most All of the right. time, but, but it, it was a difficult time. All right, Carson, thank you so much for sharing 
why you believe Iceland was so successful in tackling COVID-19. Thank you to all of the guests. Thank you for your YouTube questions as well. I will see you next time on the stream. Take care, everybody.